Hello and happy Saturday. We are back. I think uh, by now, most of you fellas and fine ladies recognize me if you uh, spend time in these odd corners of electronic media where these strange and taboo things are discussed. No, I'm just kidding. We're discussing some very, very mainstream, if understudied, topics today. I am Thomas, and I'm here with the kid Ace, who is himself a rock and roller of a subdued sort. He spends a lot of time in space. I speculate chasing naked ladies around and classic Cadillacs, like one might find in the pages of Heavy Metal magazine. I have yet to work up the nerve to ask him if he has ever witnessed a shooting shark in its natural habitat, but I increasingly fear that people might think that I am crazy, so I have not raised that with him. But on to more serious topics, if no less abstract. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about conservatism. And I'm not talking about the conservatism of Donald Trump or Mr. DeSantis. I'm not even really talking about the origins of American conservatism, qua conservatism. Really, what we're going to be talking about is the forgotten men of interwar Germany, some of whom left a great stamp themselves on the Third Reich to a greater or lesser degree, some of whom left no deliberate stamp whatsoever, but their ideas were so compelling and were so able to bring confusing events and dramatic and punctuated events that even as they underwent, even as they were underway were almost impossible for the common man as well as in a lead intellectual cast to bring into focus, some of these men were able to render descriptions of the processes then underway in not only concrete terms, but extraordinary complete ones in psychological terms. And one of those men who I'm certain that uh, not just the frogs, but any man and the ladies among us, and there are a few, who've made any kind of deep study of this topic have come across Carl Schmidt, at least uh, had him mentioned in a college course. And I was well out of college by this point, but I do remember, and I sought this out because there was a time around the early 2000s, I spent a lot of time hanging around the University of Chicago campus, not just because I'm a creep and I've got nothing to do but stalk college campuses and gawk at college girls. I'm not gonna pretend I've never done that sort of thing because every man is mired in sin, including myself, and I do a lot of silly and undignified things. However, that was not my reason for haunting the uh, corridors of the University of Chicago. At that time, as people know, who are familiar with the institution, University of Chicago, it's long been known as a hub of very original thinkers, particularly in the political science department and history department, for better and for worse. It was very much a hub of radicalism, of the IWW, of the nascent anarchist movement. Um, I believe some of the men affiliated with the assault on uh, the original courthouse that was replaced by the Dirksen building uh, hatched their conspiracies that were there. But that tangent aside, um, I was curious about John Mearsheimer, who is a fixture at the University of Chicago and some associates of mine and rather close colleagues uh, know the man and have worked with him. I do not know the man. At any event, one of them was generous enough to pass his syllabus on to me. This was right around 2002, 2003. Mr. Mearsheimer's syllabus front and center included Carl Schmitt's The Concept of the Political. Okay. Now, this was an era when, you know, war fever still, it, it had already reached its zenith. I mean, I'm talking, of course, about, you know, the 9-11 era. 
and uh, the subsequent assault upon Iraq. Um, this was still a very popular endeavor, um, even among people ordinarily who were skeptical of that sort of military action, that kind of unilateral military action on Capitol Hill, I mean. But there was a remarkable, it, Bush 43 had a remarkably strong war mandate, okay? This gave rise to a debate even among those who generally believed in the purported morality and the strategic uh, merit of the, uh, of the attack on Iraq. It gave rise to a conversation about the limits and parameters of executive decisionism. You know, when the president actually has a war mandate um, under Article 2, what the actual boundaries are of Article 2, I mean, how far does it extend? You know, um, what conceivably could be brought under that penumbra of uh, national security in emergency circumstances that would facilitate basically a rule by diktat, like in conditions of emergency or a state of war, declared or otherwise. So Mr. Mirashammer, obviously, who has very strong opinions, many things, including on matters of war and peace, as they've been discussed and conceptualized since 1945, but particularly he's a guy who is prone to assign, as I referred to a few moments ago, these forgotten sort of thinkers of the right of the inner war years like Schmidt and Schmidt's, uh, Schmidt's concept of the state was uh, intrinsically theological. Like I'm not just speaking figuratively. Schmidt dealt a lot in symbolic psychology. And when I think of Schmidt's relationship, see, this is very interesting about Schmidt. I think of Schmidt's, and I mean, you can chalk this up to the, the Hegelian in me, it kind of... Uh, insinuating uh, insinuating these features where they may not be present, but I don't accept that critique. But I believe that Schmidt is to Hobbes kind of what Marx was to Hegel, okay? Um, he accepted certain existential premises and a concrete capacity alleged by the thinker in question who served as inspiration while turning other key features of the political and social and historical schema presented by that thinker on its head. You know, like in Schmidt's case, um, Schmidt was very, very much a communitarian. Arguably, he was a racial communitarian. He certainly was a German nationalist. He certainly was a vocish German nationalist and that he believed that the German ethnos or the German race um, he believed there was biological implications of this as well as sociological ones. That's not to say he was some sort of hardline racialist, but it did definitely feature into his conceptual horizon about politics. Um, as opposed to a man like Hobbes, obviously, who um, really, um, much as I revere Hobbes, it must be acknowledged that Hobbes really did, was the founder of a liberal capital L ontology that posited, you know, a sort of uh, non-existent state of nature by which man really was an atomized individual who was simply, you know, born and willfully decided to um, take on certain associations you know, to involve himself with various identities to kind of create a pastiche of social relationships around himself. And that this ultimately led to, you know, a, a sort of loose group cohesion that came to constant loyalties. And in times of war, you know, this obviously ossified into something far more significant to uh, the, 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 our hypothetical um, man, the state of nature, it, it, his, his individual life, you know, under these war conditions, these features I just described, obviously, can represent far more a significant motivator and um, 
means of informing his value structures and preferences and fears and ambitions than it would in times of peace. But otherwise, Hobbes, I mean, obviously, not only did he not place a particular emphasis on race or ethnos or uh, kind of linear natality within a, a discrete culture, you know, he, he really put no premium on that at all. And it wasn't merely because he was taking these things for granted or expecting the reader to. It's because he, he honestly did not believe they were ontologically significant in the ways that somebody like Schmidt or uh, people like us on the right today would, uh, would view such matters. I mean, you're a learned, uh, you're a learned man, Ace. I mean, do you think that that's, uh, do you think that's a fair kind of capsule summary of, of Schmidtian uh, ontology of, of the man's, the individual man's relationship to the state in conceptual terms? Yeah, well, I would say that since we're speaking about the 20th century as a whole, almost halfway through it where we get Schmidt, you could almost summarize it as the century of ideology. And there's that famous argument that that kind of contingentness on ideology in and of itself was challenged by Schmidt. And because of the aftermath of the French Revolution and a lot of its consequences, a lot of these speakers are drowned out by other voices. And so, as you said at the yeah. top of the show, a lot of uh, figures that we'll be talking about like Schmidt are going to bring a lot of those original conservative ideas to the forefront. Yeah, I mean, that's insightful. And something that's the, uh, you know, what's really the, um, a lot of what's pub a lot of what was subsequently published, particularly in English, I can't speak to French because I, I can get by passably reading, not speaking. I, I know I, I'm not nearly anything approaching like fluent in German, but I can read German passably. Okay. Um, I cannot read French passively at all. So I, I can't comment on the nature of the translations, but the English translations of a lot of Carl Schmidt, they take essays issued by Schmidt. Um, and I mean, there was a year, as you know, like in Germany, just historically, including in the inner warriors, there's a major university culture. That's like the best way to describe it. I don't really think there's a counterpart that existed in America or the UK. Um, there really was a university culture that, you know, where, where uh, it was highly competitive between, you know, academics and that's really where kind of like ideas first entered, um, first entered, uh, like mainstream consciousness like the street level okay so like a lot of these a lot of these schmidt like books they're published like as books in the english language or like essay series that you know schmidt performed you know like over you know weeks or months or periodically what have you um when in fact uh that's not what they were and they were not intended as publications at all but one of the things that's published as kind of a compliment piece, if not a follow-up um, to Schmidt's political theology, um, and political theology has got a complicated hit publication record, like we talked about before we started recording. I don't want to get into the acts, I don't want to get bogged down, but um, be as it may, um, the compliment piece to political theology is Schmidt's essay slash lecture, slash lecture the crisis of parliamentary democracy. This feed, this pops up a lot, okay, um, in places even where you wouldn't expect to find, you know, kind of like hard esoteric, you know, like German political theory. Like I remember years back, like when I was younger than you are now, like uh, flipping through, uh, I used to flip through the American Spectator, like at Loyola, Loyola University Library, because that's like, in like the 90s, that's like what hipster young guys read instead of like the National Review. Like, that's not like an endorsement of it. It was kind of like a, it, it was not like a, a, a particularly good rag. But um, Emmett Terrell, the guy who founded it, uh, he, he did do a lot to kind of expose Clintonian corruption. So, I mean, okay, I can, 
I kind of give credit where credit is due. That was a real thing. That wasn't just, you know, kind of a confabulated, you know, make believe Watergate or, you know, moronic like a Russiagate kind of thing. That that was a real that was that was a real issue that that, that transcended policy. Okay. As it may, they had a book club. Uh the um American Spectator did. So like, you know, I, I joined it because it was like, you know, 10 bucks a month or something. So one day you get this book uh in the mail. You know, like great essays and like conservatism, and I ironic, like it, it was a weird hodgepodge um, of shit. Like you know, Norman Podhoritz and you know him writing about like how hard it was being like this, you know, put upon Jewish boy growing up in Brooklyn, and you know these black kids used to you know beat him up or whatever. So like he understands the racial problem, and you know, I, I mean, just kind of polemical crap like that, um, kind of coupled with Milton Friedman stuff. You know, Cold War era stuff uh, dropped by uh, dropped by guys like um, um, my God, I'm going senile. Um, Grover Norquist. You know, he was the flat tax guy, the original flat tax guy. But then, just kind of like interspersed within these kind of pages of like garbage, was Carl Schmidt, the crisis of parliamentary democracy. And like, how random is that? But point I'm getting at is that this is kind of the essay that would pop up. And it was mischaracterized a lot because, first of all, I think Americans, even a lot of well-meaning ones on the right, like they don't they don't really understand how parliamentary systems, particularly proportional representation systems, are like very, very different than congressional systems um, with single member districts like America has. I mean, they're just very different. Secondly, what Schmidt was talking about he wasn't just talking about pragmatic problems with a parliament that quite literally is, you know, it can, it cannot find consensus. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's a structural problem and it represents, you know, if it continues without remedy, there represents a structural failure of, of, of any state, but he was relating it to the political theology essay because his whole, uh, his whole existential and ontological claim was look like if we're talking about sovereignty you know and we're talking about um you know what people perceive as a legitimate exercise of sovereignty you know we're talking about a moral consensus okay we're talking about somebody not just surrendering their ability you know their ability to they're not just surrendering their private right to punish somebody who wrongs them you know, they're not just, uh, they're not just surrendering, you know, their ability to, um, you know, resort to self-help in ways that are going to undermine, uh, you know, the authority of the sovereign in practical terms. You know, they're not just talking about um, refraining from behavior that's going to sabotage communitarian structures that are going to cause a kind of tragedy of the commons, you know, and, you know, at, at, at the you know, they're not going to do things based that enrich themselves, you know, at the expense of the community in ways that, you know, can't be rationalized um, practically or morally, and, and that basically compromise the ability of future generations to survive and thrive, okay? What he was talking about is, like, a very deeply felt um, symbolic psychological concept, a sovereignty that really did have not just a theological motif, but a theological structure. Like Schmidt talked about, you know, a true sovereign as, you know, one who was able to act outside of the constitutional order. And that has a lot of implications. But one of the implications Schmidt continued to drive home is that you've got to think about this as a miraculous event, basically, okay? It's almost tantamount to, you know, speaking highly metaphorically, divine intervention you know um you almost have to look at it you almost have to look at the sovereign as you know god intervening in the most extreme and uh unresolvable and uh you know irredeemably broken relations between factions that must be repaired for a political structure to function or even survive um you know, you need to look at the sovereign as one, as a figure who is able to wield power that truly is outside of the constitutional structure. 
in order to repair it. And this can't be constitutionally mandated. You can't you, you can't codify, you know, as an Article Two, like we have. Oh, this is what the sovereign is permitted to do because that defeats the entire purpose. Because there's two problems there. The first problem is the nature of politics, and the reason why crises become crises, and the reason why in uh, situations like in Weimar they have, they represent such danger is because what is going to arise in parliamentary systems that's going to create this kind of gridlock that's going to create this kind of um paralysis that not only prevents the state from being able to act but that compromises its very raison d'etre like the, one of the reasons that occurs is because one simply can't anticipate there, there is no method of augury by which every possible crisis can be anticipated and we can just codify a remedy. Like that's that, that kind of thinking, it almost brings to mind, you know, what a, what the Soviets would posit about economics. That, you know, well, of course you can plan, you know, like what consumer demand is going to be. Of course you can plan, you know, like what human needs are in material terms. Like, no, you can't. You know, like unless you're somehow capable of reading every human mind you know within your national borders and unless you also have the power to augur like exactly what the decisions rendered you know from those minds that you've read and what those preferences you interpreted you know are going to affect and and everything else i mean obviously it's ridiculous counterfactual but you know what we're talking about in terms of schmidt's sovereign one who not only is able to act outside of the constitution but that his very role like existentially like what he what he has to be able to do is to be outside of the legal political structure in order to impose himself often violently because that's what's called for in order to repair the in order to repair the failing structure um that requires a remarkable confidence, for lack of a better word. Okay, that requires. It, it, this, we're not even talking about patriotism, and we're not even talking about you know people believing in the basic goodness of governments, like social goods. I'm talking about, not moral ones. Um, like it, it really is almost a faith-based uh, enterprise. You know, you really, it really requires a level of commitment at the personal level it really requires a belief structure above and beyond the pragmatic and above and beyond you know that which is useful in short-term discrete capacities and the big implication there um aside from the fact that you know we have a president we have a presidential system and it seems to be comp constantly compromised by those who find presidential systems to be intrinsically prone to overreach and abuse of power. I have my own views on that. And uh, those who read my content in depth will know what I'm getting that. It doesn't, getting at, it does not need to be repeated here. But um, if you want to basically overcome what Schmidt views as this mortal crisis that inevitably results within parliamentary structures, you need this sovereign that he has described to be the actor that symbolically and actually is capable of remedying these uh, destructive tendencies. And the body politic has to have an almost messianic view of this individual, where they at least have to believe that he has a mandate there's metaphysical in nature and uh, trust within him that, you know, he really does have the grace and favor of the Lord in order to act. Otherwise, you're essentially availing yourself to tyranny based on the, uh, based on the absence of any other alternatives. If you uh, approve of that take, um, Forgive me if that was long-winded and pedantic, but uh, does that basically meet your uh, your approval? Yeah, that's that's right in line there. And also, it's worth no, it's notable that 
narrowing down how to find that per that public virtue is important and Absolutely. looking searching for the possibilities to have state sponsored virtue is something definitely that uh political people should be interested in another connection i wanted to make in line with your description on sovereignty the political theology book or essay you know whatever we'd like to refer it as it really, I think it syncs up with St. Augustine's City of God and judging the secular and religious governments to see which ones have a lot more merit to them. And I, I think we'll find that the latter always seems to persist throughout time. No, I'm sure you're right. I'm not well, I, I am not well read in St. Augustine. Like, honestly, I'm well read in Aquinas, um, only to a couple of things, because I went to Loyola. Um, and because... Uh, if you go to law school, um, at least when I did, uh, that's really some of the, like, Thomas uh, philosophy in Aristotle, that's really the only, uh, that, that's really the only like, a hard and fast, like, philosophy, like, you get in law school. So, yeah, you're, you, I, I guarantee you, you are way more well-versed in this stuff than I am. But your underlying point, I agree with that 100%. Like, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the, I don't want to go on too far a tangent, but like what you just raised, a lot of people come at me very heavily because I am such a Protestant with saying like, how can you defend these thinkers like Schmidt, like the Maestro, um, like Aquinas so zealously when your theological orientation is what it is. Um, I find it very easy to do, frankly. Okay. And I think, I again, I don't want to sabotage the convo. This, this is a topic for another day, but I think the maestro is very much a Protestant in some ways, and uh, that was one of the things his enemies levied against him. They called him a Freemason, which he really wasn't. Um, but uh, in any event, um, that's no, I, I agree with you 100%. And that's one of the problems with um, the void of uh, that's one of the problems with um what uh what uh you know when when uh i mean that's one of, that's one of the reasons why the was failing system i couldn't hold i mean let's be honest here okay if it wasn't it may be useless to talk about such a counterfactual because bolshevism and the rise of it um was so world-shaking and earth-shattering and because the 20th century was such a uh horrific um symphony of bloodletting um if it had not been bolshevism it would have been something else because the westphalian the westphalian structure really didn't make any sense you know and uh it, it created um it created uh it, it created it created wedges where there didn't have to be proverbially and literally and um when it should have been when it should have been acting towards the opposite. I mean, I don't get me wrong, in political terms, I think the church's day was done. And I, I know that there's going to be a bunch of hostile comments because I just said that, you know, from Catholic guys who mean well, but who mis either misinterpreted that or just think I'm a, being a bastard. But um, the uh, that's exactly, yeah. I mean, what we're talking about... Um, even in the pre-modern, even in the early modern state, you know, even in the pre-20th century state where the sovereign wields truly incredible destructive power and where occurrences within the state, you know, can have massive implications in, in the 20th century, I mean, I mean, today too, but especially in the 20th century, like what goes on within the state in terms of acts of state perpetuated by, perpetuated by the sovereign has got war and peace implications that could lead to the destructive power to that could lead to a destructive power being mustered and just like undreamed of in eras past um the absence of an institution like the church in order to validate the uh ethical virtue um symbolically if not actually of the sovereign the elimination of that was catastrophic um, at the same time, um, I mean, this is a very interesting question, isn't it? It's like, who would you rather be led by? 
would uh would you rather be led by a Caesar Borgia or would you rather be led by a uh an Oliver Cromwell or a Muhammad who believes he's in direct congress with God? I believe that's uh I realize that's a loaded question and everything, and but it is a thought experiment. Okay, and there is no perfect system. But yeah, I mean you're absolutely right in the fact that uh that's something interestingly on the timeline there's uh there's all these like neo-pagan idiots and like they're fucking idiots like that's uh i generally don't like come that hard on people because i'm cruel and i i especially younger people but these jagoffs who like you know think that they're they, they they think they're on our side but they've got this totally imaginary idea of their culture but like they uh the uh one of their big uh, critiques, and I've, I've heard this from secularists too, you know, not just from fools like that. You know, it's like, look, man, like I'm a dissenter Protestant, I'm a Presby, and so are my forefathers. And I'm as like old stock American as you can get. And I'm a proud white man and I'm as pro-white as can be. But I realize like Europe is like the Catholic faith and the Catholic faith is Europe and continental Europe like needs it to survive. And how anybody can think otherwise, um, in political terms, I mean, um, there's a, a sociological and moral dimension here too, but how anybody can think otherwise is incredible to me. And again, man, like, I'm a fucking, I'm a fucking rock and roll Peckerwood, like, crusty guy. I'm not some, like, I'm not some, like, Ignatius Riley guy, like, who spends, like, all his time fucking in, in some city Cantus church, like, you know, or I mean, I'm making a bad joke, but I mean, my point is, man, like, this is clear to me. Like, how is this not clear to like fucking like believing Catholics? Like, I it's it's incredible to me. I just I don't get it. But uh, I'll tell you what, my friend, I've been dominating this conversation too much, and I gotta feed my nicotine habit. So we're gonna take five minutes, and I'm gonna smoke, and then we're gonna get your takes on some of this stuff, man, because. Everybody, uh, everybody gets to hear me talk all the time, and everybody's fucking sick of it. So, how does that sound to you? That sounds great, man. We'll take five. All right. There's a, uh, I mean, a dimension we haven't so much gotten into, um, particularly in the American context, is uh, there's very much a sociological aspect to the body politics view of sovereign authority and in the 20th century obviously this dovetailed with psychology and psychology was was kind of the social science um owing to various factors um not just through the war years and interwar years but well after um you know i honestly remain in vogue in my opinion until the 80s but the zenith of, the, of American sociology really was about the 40s to the 70s. And I know that you brought up C. Wright Mills, which is dope. That warms my heart because, shit, even, uh, I mean, even when I was a young dude, like nobody was reading C. Wright Mills anymore, which I think is a freaking crime, frankly, because he was, uh, he and Christopher Lash were, were, uh, were brilliant, genuinely American thinkers who, who had an incredible insight into the, not just into the kind of cultural landscape and, and what was underway um, after, during and after the, the New Deal revolution. But I know you got something to say about C. Wright Mills. And uh, I, 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 frankly, I mean, I, I'm not being polite. I'm very interested in what you got to say about that and how C. Wright Mills and his whole kind of theory of, uh, of the individual v of the state plays into what we're talking about so whatever you're comfortable dropping on that man like i'm all ears as are anybody who's tuning into us i guarantee it cool man well thank you first and foremost for that but i just want to say that in these circles people always recommend books everyone's got a book list and it's it's usually pretty pessimistic and it's it's all novels on how we're going to lose and how bad things are but when I came across C. Wright Mills, I noticed there was a lot of optimism, at least from my perspective. When he's talking about the, the model of the American government, he's critiquing you know, the revolving door. I think that's where I learned that from. 
kind of how the huh. American government system works as a mechanical device. But no, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. And so and he's I, a good Calvin piece to burn on. Let me just interject that. Like oh, uh, yeah. guys your age dig burn on. I mean, that's well placed. People should read burn on, but those of you out there, you know, like Ace here, like read fucking C. Wright Mills. If no, for no other reason, he is a compliment piece of a splendid sort to Burnham. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it's, I, I would say it as a good source because it's making the ideas we're trying to communicate in the really palatable terms. You know, we talk a lot about Edmund Burke and Russell Kirk if, and from their respective countries, but a lot of that stuff is applicable to you know, American conservatism. And I get that your average Zoomer is more infatuated with, what, what did you say, Snorlax? <laughs> I understand, yeah. you know, that this is very uh, <laughs> academic, you know, economic type stuff. And so I'm trying to give them a non-academic answer and translating the, the books and magazines and all these think tanks. The traditional conservatism from a sociological perspective is highlighted in C. Wright Mills and also Kirk as well to kind of make these timeless ideas a little more visual for people who, you know, this stuff is, right. so, it's, it's hard to communicate it in, you know, something that Generation Z would be able to understand. Well, it makes it, when is it concrete? I mean, if, even if you're an older guy, I mean, the fact of the matter is there's a, I mean, even if, even if you're multilingual, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I can passively read German and uh, that's after, you know, friggin' 25 years of, basically immersing myself in, you know, like 20th century, study of 20th century, um, you know, Weimar and Third Reich and stuff. But um, it's, it's beyond like, a, it's, it's beyond the linguistic unintelligibility. Like um, any European theorist, um, any European social theorist or political thinker, like, I mean, he's drawing on a thousand years of precedence. And there's just there, there's just certain conceptual assumptions that aren't going to be resonant with an American reader. Like even a guy like yourself, who's got a very good command of like where his own people are from and has got a good command of theology and who's got a good command of history and, you know, and kind of war and peace. And, you know, the nuances therein that, that kind of shaped like the European personality, you know, like severally and collectively. Like there's just there's there's just gonna be things that are 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 not gonna be intelligible to an American reader. Like there's not, and yeah, Mills, um, he, to your point, he doesn't just draw a roadmap like Burnham does about what the modern state is and how to understand it, um, and the kind of divide between what it actually is in structural terms as well as its ethical rationalizations and its view of self and its actual nature. But he describes these things in very concrete ways that are familiar to everybody. Like I'm not suggesting he is dumbed down at all. He's very complicated and very complete. You know, it is by no means some for dummies version of like, oh, hey, this is how to understand, you know, the apparatus of modern state. But um yeah, he's he's very concrete, and that's why I dropped before the break. He's very American. I meant that in in the most uh, praise were praiseworthy terms possible, not at all punitive. So yeah, you're absolutely right, man. And and sociology also, it's I think it's being somewhat revived because like we've talked about before, like on the internet. I mean, at your fingertips, and I can't. I know I know I sound like some like fucking annoying old man always saying like. You know, you used to have to go to the library and find what you were looking for. You know, just like if you wanted to jerk off, you had to go find a nudie magazine. Like, I mean, nobody that's I, I realize it's lame to like fucking drop that kind of shit. But it actually it, it is it truly is revolutionary that you can now access like any text you want um, at, at a keystroke. Um, and it's not it's not like things are doomed to kind of like this this uh i mean shit man like um if something went out of print like 40 years ago um i mean entire in entire genres of 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 uh of academia would, would basically just be like you know literally like relegated to ashes you know 
the uh, main the main theorists would no longer be taught on college campuses. They'd no longer be referenced. They'd no longer be cited. You know, their uh, their books ended up in trash bins. There'd be no subsequent runs. It's like it never existed. I mean, there's this there's something really like quaintly or willy and almost about what I'm describing. But it it very much happened. Like these days, a guy like you, he'll come up and you know realize like you know there's something to sociology. Um, you know, maybe I'll come to it from reading like something like Frank Herbert's Dune. Maybe I'll come to it from reading like, you know, uh, um, Suicide of the West by Burnham. You know, I'll be like, you know, there's something to this. Like, let me find out more about sociology. You know, so you can enter like three friggin' search terms and find out, oh, wow, you know, there's C. Wright Mills, there's fucking Christopher Lash, you know, there's all of these, um, you know, there's Eric Hoffer, who I'm not a fan of, but he's worth reading. You know, there's, uh, um, there's a uh, there's Barnes, you know, who the revisionist, but who started out as sort of a sociologist. I mean, like it's all there, man. Like it's uh, that you can develop, you truly can develop a complete picture these days, man. So there's there's no excuse for not doing so. And um, again, it's not just it's not just like old man talk. Like when I drop these things, it, it was a total freaking like game changer, man. Like it uh, it was really. Like even even thirty years ago, like it was really hard, man. Like uh, you'd find um, at like a young age, I I mean, I was always kind of a troublemaker and like kind of a jag off. So like I I kind of seek out stuff that like people weren't supposed to read. And uh, like this older guy in my neighborhood uh, who was cool, like he and his wife were really cool, and like they had a son who was like a few years older than me, and then, you know, it's so, like so we we chill together like sometimes, you know, like people and neighbors do like he subscribed to American free press, you know, Willis Cardo's rag and he'd like drop, drop it on me. He'd be like, Hey, read this, you know, like this is what's really going on. I mean, dude was like a, a good guy, but not a real intellectual, but I started reading American free press and stuff. And like from there, you know, I found out about David Irving and, you know, like they'd have write-ups and stuff like Hitler's war. And then, like, on the more lowbrow side, you know, I'd come across zines, you know, like, Tom Metzger's, like, War, you know, which was, like, crazy and stuff. <laughs> but, I mean, that was, like, part of the fun of it. But it's, like, my point is, man, like, you, you had, you, if you wanted something outside, like, what CNN was saying, like, these are the places, like, you had to go, you know. And on the more, like, kind of academic side, um, it was uh you were basically relegated to like what your local library had i mean i had the chicago public library system i grew up in the suburbs but i was you know a 20 minute train ride from downtown so i could go you know i had a chicago library card so i could go to any chicago public library but it's like obviously they were like you know censoring stuff like out of circulation that you know wasn't like you know politically correct you know particularly in like, you know, the early nineties when that was really, really jumping off in earnest. But yeah, I mean, it, uh, just the fact that, you know, like a smart, like young dude, like you is, is, is seeking out like all the right freaking sources, like 30 years ago, like you wouldn't have been able to do that, man. You know, it's, it's, that's one of the reasons why as I'm always dropping on, you know, the freaking black pill team, like we're winning. I, for, forgive me, man, for like the freaking uh, monologue. I, 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 I feel very strongly about this. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to uh, steal all the oxygen in the proverbial room. You know what I mean? No, no, no problem, man. I hear you. And another source I want to throw out there is yeah, we mentioned yeah. her in one of our other episodes, but Phyllis Schlafly's book, A Choice Not an Echo. I didn't even realize she does a great job of putting the lengthy text into imagery, just exactly what the situation was in DC and just yeah, the Rockefeller establishment and all the nuances of it. She could translate yeah. that to a grassroots palatable populist level, you know, group of people that could, that could understand it. And so vote with a little more, a little more knowledge, you know, when they go to the ballot box. So no, she was a she was a real serious lady, man, and she was really, really badly treated by the by the Republican establishment. Like he, Michael Jones, made that point. But yeah, Shafley, she really broke down the nuts and bolts and like kind of warts it all about um uh, yeah, it's your point about like how how um how the political process works in America, particularly in the late twentieth century. Like what did it come to? And yeah, the role of PACs. 
and uh like horse trading and like quite literally how like uh you know kind of the arbitrariness of like what's declared you know like a safe seat and like quite quite literally um quite literally the two-party duopoly just you know they i mean again it's like horse trading man like they they're basically um you know they've got a they, they've they've got their seats where there's like a consensus you know that are like that safely belong to them to them then there's those in contention and like you know they bargain over those and like the elections are really like largely meaningless man like it's almost it's gotten to the point really of almost like ritual and that's why when you do have a trump or a nixon and I mean, i'm not i'm not comparing nixon to trump in in intellectual terms or ethical terms like i i i got tremendous respect for nixon whatever my differences with what the man's politics were like i think i, I think trump's basically a freaking you know media uh creature but uh point is like any 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 executive who raises a specter of uh of uh of actual uh invoking actual sovereign authority i mean they they, they literally like lose their fucking mind like the deep state i mean as well as the entire um kind of informal uh structure of PACs and 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 soft money contributors and and lobbyists and everybody else like you're absolutely um you're absolutely uh you're absolutely right i don't uh i don't want to keep you too long ace what else do you want to uh what else do you want to cover what, what do you want to wrap up with i just want to wrap up by saying as you pointed out you know there are a lot of black pillars a lot of people are pessimistic and i totally i totally feel them and i understand that but one of the, the reasons for a video like this is to kind of show them some receipts and some sources of people that kind of laid out how exactly to feel optimistic even though you can be living under you know tyrannical rule or you feel like sources are limited there is you know an appropriate way to to understand what's happening and so that's why i find a lot of hope in you know i know Schlaff. I know she's abroad, but you know she kind of <laughs> shows what is possible for you know a real populist. You know, what do they call it? What's the San Francis uh, Middle American? You know, revolution from the revolution bottom. from the middle. Yeah, yeah. That stuff is definitely you know. Oh uh, no, no. There's there's um. I mean, they're rare because it um. You know what? Uh, I uh. Um, men aren't smarter than women and like women aren't dumb and i i it bothers me people speaking that way i mean i know that you're not but it's i mean conceptually ontologically like women lead very different lives so it's, it's just rare you're going to find female political thinkers like it's just rare but you 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 are going to find some of them particularly as it involves the sociological aspect and like where the rubber meets the road in terms of electoral politics and lobbying and um you there's no shame in citing phyllis shafley or you you needn't like qualify that like you're you're absolutely right she is a dope source on the subject that you are raising and um yeah no there's um there's uh there's um there's this female um political commentators very much worth their salt i mean the fact that they might the fact that they're the minority i mean that's fine um but no i uh i uh i uh i i take her very seriously man like i i always did um no need no need to qualify it of course of course and i just want to say uh, i think that covers everything we wanted and we were originally going to be joined by a very prudent youtuber who will we'll find a video for us later on you guys can look forward to that but i just want to thank you again thomas it's always it's always a blast man Talk oh no you. yeah i agree man let's lay uh honestly um all I'm doing these days is I got to uh, I got a bunch of uh, merchandise I'm sending out to people, which uh, I am stoked to say that you're very excited about. I'm sending out that merchandise fast as I can, and there's a lot of it. And I don't want I mean I'm a, I'm a one man operation. I'm not trying to play a martyr. I mean I I'm I'm fucking stoked like people want it, but um, Steel Storm Two I am committed to dropping it in December. Um, I'm writing a piece on, I, I right now, uh, the other paid job I have is uh, writing, um, um, writing, uh, I'm contributing to an essay on, I mean, thinkers of the right. Um, and my contribution is about Sorrell. Um, I gotta get that finished in coming weeks. Um, 
because I got to make money. Um, but I, I, I'm very enthusiastic about the project anyway. But point being, now, anytime you want to cut these videos, man, um, I'm happy to do it. I prefer weekends, but that's not essential. But do not ever hesitate, man, to freaking uh, 